Hello everyone, we are live from the Antwerp Hof van Lieren. Today we invited Professor Sunchitza Vujic to talk about econometrics and labor economics. We are Lara and Lothar, you're listening to Profcast. We are here with Professor Sunchitza Vujic, all the way from Serbia. So how was your day today? It was sunny, um, just like my name. <laughs> so... Um, if anyone is wondering where the name comes from. So Sunčica actually means uh, like a little sun. So Sunce is sun in Serb creation and Sunčica is the name which comes from the word sun. So okay, it was a sunny morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you are originally for Ser from Serbia, but how did you end up here then? Uh, by train from London Paddington <laughs> to Brussels out. Um, yeah, that's a joke, but it, it's true. <laughs> so I'm originally from Yugoslavia. So I was born in Yugoslavia and um, I, I did my undergrad. I started in a country called Yugoslavia, which then reformed into Serbia and Montenegro, which then became Serbia. So I did my undergrad um, there um, in the 90s. Um, in economics and uh, after that I moved to do my master uh, degree at uh, Central European University in Budapest and after that it became clear that I want to pursue an academic career so I applied for different uh, positions to get uh, PhD funding um, and I landed a PhD position uh, in Amsterdam so then I moved from Budapest to Amsterdam where I did my MPhil first at the Timbergen Institute in Amsterdam, and then my PhD in economics at econometrics at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam. And after a couple of jobs in both public and private sector in the Netherlands, um, I landed my first uh, academic job uh, in London. So I was working there first as a, a research assistant at the um, London School of Economics at the Center for uh, Economic Performance. And after that, I also um, did a postdoc there at the Department of Management. So then after that, I had my first uh, professorship position or assistant professorship position at the University of Bath, where I spent uh, three years. And then I moved to Antwerp in 2014, indeed taking a train from London Paddington to uh, Brussels out and then uh, continuing further to Antwerp to take up a position of uh, associate professor. Uh, at the University of Antwerp. So in a way, this was, um, this was a, a career progress, all my path basically from Belgrade via Budapest, Amsterdam, London, Bath, and now Antwerp. Uh, in a way, you can, you can see it as a career progression, first uh, education-wise, then really um, basically stepping to, to, to better positions. And, uh, the, the position in Antwerp, uh, if you want, really had my name on it <laughs> because uh, it was advertised as a tenured position in uh, applied econometrics with applications to labor economics. And this is in a nutshell what, what my research is about. You teach econometrics. What does that entail? So have you studied econometrics no, not yourself yet. no <laughs> you had it you I probably it. have yeah uh, i had a course of peter goes okay peter goes in the third bachelor okay. business engineering but she is studying second bachelor yes so next year. i think yeah next year i will have it okay so i'll try to illustrate it uh, basically using an example uh, but in a nutshell uh, econometrics is or what does it entail it entails bringing theory to the data so, for example, if you start from the theory where we say that education is an investment, so the human capital theory says that education is an investment, we want to see whether, uh, as an investment, what are the returns to additional years of education. So this is the question that we want to answer. And we can, um, uh, if we think of the returns to additional years of education, we usually think of in terms of future wages. Right? So we all pursue additional years of education in order to have better labor market prospects. Now, this is what the theory says, but uh, we also want to bring this to the data and we want to uh, estimate this empirically and actually have an answer what is the return in terms of these financial returns to an additional year of education. 
So if you think simplistically, you can say, well, it's a correlation between um, education and wages. But it's not just that, because wages are not determined just by somebody's years of education. You also need to include other factors in this relationship or a function. So these other factors are uh, maybe your previous work experience or a tenure with a firm, uh, the sector you work in, or uh, whether you work part-time or full-time, but you also have other factors, which we don't necessarily think of factors determining one's wages, but uh, such as gender, or um, whether you're a native or a migrant, um, or whether you are married. So these factors might also, in a way, affect uh, one's wages. So if you think like this, so you, can't, you, you need to go now further from the simple correlation between wages and education, you need to take into account that this relationship entails other factors and you already have a function which you want to estimate based on the data. So what kind of data do we need to estimate this function? And I will, I will try to <laughs> summarize what, the, what do we mean by estimation. Uh, we can usually use data like uh, labor force survey data, where you have um, data on uh, individuals, uh, their socio-demographic characteristics, but also these labor market characteristics. Um, and then we can estimate this relationship, this function or a regression, as we call it. And in an ideal scenario, we would include all the factors that affect future wages, and once we've done that and we apply this estimation method, which is known as the ordinary least squares, then the coefficient that we estimate next to your uh, education measure or a variable represents the returns to an additional year of education. So in a way, if you would have this uh, ideal scenario, as I say, which means that you include really all the factors that affect one's wages into this function or regression, you estimate it, you have this coefficient, which represents the returns to an additional year of education, and you can test different hypotheses. You can use this coefficient uh, for policy making and so forth. So in a nutshell, this is what econometrics is about. So what I just explained to you would be a basically different steps you would take going from theory to the data in order to confirm um, some uh, theor theoretical, um, let's say, uh, hypotheses or assumptions. So now uh, you think then, so why is then econometrics so difficult? Because I managed to explain it in a couple of minutes. Well, then we have some other uh, complications. So I said that this relationship might hold in an ideal uh, world, but usually uh, what does this mean? It means that you have all the factors that affect wages to include into this function or a regression. And this is not always the case because you can also think that uh, both education and wages are affected by your ability or perseverance or your patience. And usually we don't have this, uh, this information in the data. So essentially you're missing some relevant information in the data. So when you estimate this regression by this method, which we called ordinary least squares, you won't get what you really think you're getting in terms of estimation. You will get something called a biased estimate. And this is what takes us then to more advanced methods. So we try to correct for this bias. We try to find exogenous variation, what we, what we call in econometrics. So that would be, in a nutshell, uh, what econometrics entails. So bringing theory to the data, trying to find the data which would uh, enable you to, to estimate the, the hypothesized relationship, trying to find uh, a method which would allow you to estimate what we call unbiased coefficients. And um, if I can bring it further uh, home for you, for example, last year, to 2021, the Nobel Prize in Economics went to three uh, professors, David Hart, Joshua Angrist, and Hido Imbens, in particular for their advances in um, uh, labor economics and empirical labor economics, and in, let's say, using um, exogenous variations, natural experiments, in order to be able to estimate what we call a causal relationship between different, um, different um, variables. In this case, the example that I gave between education and uh, wages. And why are you so interested in econometrics? That's a very good question. Um, so since I left Serbia, uh, every time I came into um, 
uh, into environments where um, where people uh, did econometrics. I mostly came across men. So it's a very male dominant uh, subject abroad, but not where I come from. So uh, I was inspired by a lot of uh, women um, who did econometrics at my bachelor uh, uh, degree. Uh, before that, uh, then I need to go a bit earlier um, in, uh, in my high school. I actually specialized. Uh, so when I was uh, doing my high school, we could uh, choose specialization and I actually specialized in mathematics. So in my high school, I did uh, um, mathematical specialization where we had a lot of different mathematics, statistics, probability um, courses. And actually before starting economics for a year, I actually studied mathematics. So uh, also in Belgrade. So in a way, when I uh, moved, when I switched to economics, uh, econometrics was in a way the, the best match or connection between my previous education, which was uh, relying purely on mathematics and then um, with economic theories. So this was a perfect match or a marriage, if you want. So this is where I found myself, um, or put it this other way, when in my first year of university in economics, the, the, I was mostly excited by courses which had a lot of mathematical applications, such as microeconomics, statistics, mathematics, and later on econometrics. Professor Sunchitsa Vujic wrote the article The Crime-Reducing Effects of Education, which is downloaded 80,000 times. Uh, since I went in quite, uh, quite an extensive explanation on what uh, econometrics is about, and since I um, illustrated it using um, estimation of the wage regression, so it becomes then easier for me to link um, now education to crime. So essentially, if you think of a function relating education uh, to wages, you can also think of other returns to additional years of education, not just in terms of what we call monetary or pecuniary returns, but also non-monetary or non-pecuniary returns, such as crime, such as fertility, such as health outcomes, such as democratic voting, even a marriage market prospects. There is research which shows causally that additional year of education improve uh, one's um, uh, marriage market prospects. So if we think like that, uh, we can then uh, use methodology and econometric uh, methodology that we developed for estimating the relationship between wages and education to try to estimate the relationship between education and crime. So obviously the mechanisms behind are different. So there are different mechanisms that explain this relationship. And you can think of three key mechanisms. One is the what we call the income effect. So the more education you have, the better labor market prospects that you have. And then if you commit crime, basically you have the um, higher opportunity costs because you have a lot to lose in, in this case. So that's one, uh, one mechanism. The second mechanism, we call it incapacitation, which means that if you're at school, you, your, limit, your time is limited to do other things, to pursue other uh, activities, including risky uh, activities such as committing crime. And the third uh, mechanism, which is also a bit difficult to show, would be that additional years of education make individuals more mature, more uh, patient, more risk averse. So that what we call um, individuals put higher weight on these future returns because you need to think that you're, you have a trade-off here. Uh, do I stay in education or do I drop out of education and do fun stuff like uh, committing crime or uh, doing uh, or working because sometimes education can be seen as a, as a bit... Uh, uh, not exciting enough if you want, but education can basically make individuals more mature, more patient, such that these future, such that you give more weight to these future returns and in a way um, uh, wait out for these exciting uh, things in life um, and uh, postpone if you want uh, joining uh, the, the world out there. Um, and also you might become also more risk averse in the sense that 
you know, you, you think twice whether you want to commit a crime because you're aware that there are uh, punishments uh, and all the other repercussions involved uh, with that and you give a higher weight uh, to this. So this is what we mean, um, more risk averse. So in a nutshell, you could think of um, as if trying to estimate the relationship between education and wages, but then replacing wages with uh, crime or these other outcomes, you can still use the same uh, econometric toolbox or toolkit that you developed uh, uh, in the first place, but uh, you have uh, different mechanisms and different uh, paths if you want to explain this relationship. And most importantly, in policy making, you can then use education as a, as a lever to prevent crime. So we think of crime prevention rather than um, letting people commit crime and then um, solving the problem of crime by, by basically developing uh, punishment. So you are also much involved with labor market position and gender pay. So is it still a persistent problem that women are paid less? Uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's still a problem, <laughs> unfortunately, and it's a global problem. It's one of the most persistent global labor market challenges. Um, so not just when I say global, it's not just in Belgium or the, or the Europe, but it's really a global phenomenon. And this can be looked uh, against the fact that women actually uh, accumulate uh, more years of education nowadays than men. So you have a situation, a paradoxical situation, where women tend to overtake men in terms of, um, let's say, uh, university diplomas, but at the same time on the work floor, they're still uh, paid less. So why is that? Uh, there are different uh, explanations behind it. Uh, and one key explanation, it has to do with female household roles. Um, so women often work part-time uh, they might also choose sectors, employers, which allow them to have this better, what we call, work-life balance. And this might be at the cost of lower wages. So they might actually prefer the employers, which enable them to, to have, as I said, the better work-life balance at the cost of lower wages. So this observed gender pay gap has partly to do with these household roles and female preferences. The second uh, explanation for the existing gender pay gap might have to do with the personality characteristics. And yesterday, at, um, um, yesterday we actually had a presentation at, um, at a seminar of the Department of Economics. And the day before that, I was also in a, a PhD committee meeting of a student uh, at the KU Leuven who is also looking at the gender pay gap. And both of these uh, papers actually relate uh, partly this presence of gender pay gap to, to personality traits. So in the data, we see that women tend to be um, more risk averse. Um, and as the title of the book that I just brought says that women don't ask so that they are, we are quite bad at negotiating our salaries and uh, uh, that we tend to have an issue of asking for a raise or something like that. So, so part of it, it has to do with personality traits. But um, the third uh, reason is definitely uh, discrimination on the work floor. So even if you take into account all the factors, if you take into account and you try to compare comparables, so let's say men and women who have the same level of education, who both have similar roles, work uh, similar amount of hours, uh, we still uh, see um, that women tend to be less promoted, that uh, they're uh, spending relatively more time in the roles and tasks which do not lead to promotion. And uh, we also see, for example, that there are much less women who are, um, um, who are in CEO positions. So we also call this uh, glass ceiling. So um, uh, in Belgium, I think that Belgium is relatively, I think, uh, equal in, in that sense. I think the situation in Belgium might be better than in, in, in other countries. Um, the same should be the case uh, at, the, at the universities because the, the salary scales are very fixed, they're very institutionalized, so there's not much space for uh, negotiations. 
Um, but uh, I, I can give one example which is close to my heart. Um, so at the university, you can think of the requirement of equal gender representation in different committees. Okay, so this policy uh, had an intention to promote gender equality in, in um, decision making. But if there are uh, less female professors than male professors, so what you will get is that women are disproportionately more in different committees, in different admin roles. And these admin roles do not necessarily lead to promotion. What leads to promotion is research output is attracting uh, external funding. So you have here, again, a, 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 a counterproductive, if you want, effect of a policy which had an intention to promote gender equality, at least when it comes to uh, decision making. But in the long run, it might actually affect uh, uh, female professors uh, and produce uh, or it might harm uh, female professors and produce even more gender inequality if, as I said, they're not simply enough, uh, both male and female uh, professors to be on these different committees and in these different admin roles. So you also wrote an article, Double Jeopardy, How Refugees Fare in One European Labour Market. So what were your findings then? And how do you think this will play out with the Ukraine refugees? This is a... Um This is a very big question, and I think we would need a couple of PhD students and a few researchers to answer it all, but I'll try. Um, so first, again, to give you a bit of a background, this is a project uh, that I worked on joint with uh, the colleagues from the Faculty of Social Sciences, so Professor Yves Marx and uh, Dries Lenz. Um, so this paper was one chapter in Dries' PhD thesis, which he's defending in May this year, to advertise it a bit. Um, so what we did, we looked uh, into how refugees in Belgium fare in the labor market compared to other migrants, other types of migrants, family migrants or labor migrants. So I would be a, a labor mig migrant and my husband would be a family migrant because he moved to Belgium be because of me and uh, uh, to natives. So we compared them to other types of migrants and the natives. Now, uh, I said earlier that, I, that the access to Belgian data is still a challenge, but if you have uh, uh, experienced co-authors, uh, local co-authors, then it becomes easier. So thanks to Eve and Dries, we actually um, uh, had access to, to quite nice uh, data for Belgium. And we are looking at labor market trajectories of refugees who arrived in Belgium between 1999 and 2009. So this even before the 2015 uh, Syrian refugee crisis. So what is particular about Belgium? So how do you uh, or why is Belgium an interesting case? Well, it offers a relatively easy formal uh, labor, labor access to refugees and to other types of mig migrants. But they, um, but they might face other barriers in this labor market, which is regulated and institutionalized. And the first thing that comes to my mind is, is basically the, the language. So uh, um, as I said, um, uh, I came to Belgium as a labor migrant. So I had a job, but my husband came as a family migrant. And if I think of his, let's say, baby steps into Belgian labor market. It took quite a lot of, while, uh, quite a lot of time to, to, grasp, uh, to learn the language, to, um, uh, to, to actually uh, pre-qualify him and to, to find a job. So, um, so I know exactly what uh, these refugees have also been um, uh, experiencing. So what we show is that uh, refugees take significantly longer to enter the first employment um, as compared to other migrant groups. So it takes them more time to uh, enter the first employment. And, and you, I mean, I can think of, again, of these uh, language uh, challenges. What is also a risk that they are facing, uh, it's uh, the risk of exiting out of their first uh, employment spell back into social assistance and into unemployment. So this, uh, what we observe, we observe a low employment rates of refugees not only because they're slowly integrating uh, into the society or the labor market, but also because they are exiting relatively fast from these uh, first uh, employment uh, spells. So um, what we indicate through these findings is that 
you know, helping refugees or other migrants to find the first job is not really um, sufficient to ensure labor market participation in the long run because these jobs may be short-lived. So you need really need to follow the, the full trajectory. It's not enough that somebody finds a job and then loses this job in, in two months' time. So what we show is that uh, policies should be designed in such a way that they should support really sustainable long-run labor market integration. So if we think now of the current situation, which is a very, very relevant and very interesting, and it's basically everywhere on the news, the Ukrainian refugee crisis. So what we show in the paper can certainly be extended. So there are certainly lessons learned that can be applied to the uh, Ukrainian refugee crisis. But in comparison to, to, to previous, um, uh, to previous um, refugee crisis and uh, other migrant moves, you also have a certain... Uh, differences. So, for example, there are changes in in in, uh, in legal access to the labor market. They've been. Um, um, I, I think they, they, uh, uh, the the EU immediately kind of um, um, weakened their barriers to accessing different labor markets in Europe in terms of uh, the, the length of stay because Ukrainian is Ukra Ukraine is uh, outside of the uh, European Union. So um, there are different, definitely similarities, but there are also differences um, which we need to take into account to make any type of conclusions. So at this point, I can also advertise that uh, with another group of researchers from the University of Mannheim, we are currently actually in the process of submitting um, an Horizon Europe funding proposal, uh, which the topic of this uh, research will be the east-west migration in Europe. So we really, so the, originally, the original idea was to look at the east-west migration. And then in the meantime, the, the war happened and the Ukrainian refugee crisis happened. So we, could, we will actually have a, a separate section of the project proposal focusing on uh, Ukrainian refugee crisis and really focusing, first of all, on the demographics behind it. Because if you think about it, Syrian refugee crisis, you had a lot of young men. Now, actually, you have a lot of women with children. So there is a demographic divide. Um, then we need to take into account the response of the EU, which I think is much more open and much more welcoming to uh, Ukrainian refugees than it is or it was to maybe uh, Syrian refugees. So there is a different response uh, of, the, of the EU and individual countries. We will also uh, look at the attitudes. So there seems to be different attitudes towards Ukrainian refugees versus other refugees. And this is also important. It's a social phenomenon that we should uh, look at. And finally, we will uh, look at the labor market integration. So to sum up, the research that we've done definitely offers some policies or lessons to be learned or applied uh, to the current situation. But I think it's uh, it's it's quite a unique uh, it's quite unique what is currently happening, and uh, we are planning to do research on this in the next few years, with or without funding. <laughs> if we get funding, it will be uh, better. But uh, and and then I can I can give you some more answers uh, on this question. This was Profcast with Sunchitsa Vujic. Thank you for listening. Do you want to hear more? Then be sure to visit our website, uentrepen.be slash profcast.